Lord says to one of the ladies, he says, she had chosen the better part. So now we're just going to worship and we're going to give thanks. Get your elements together. Thank you, Dad. Good morning. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory, 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 glory to the Lord God Almighty. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you've done and all that you're, you're doing and that you would continue to do. We worship you. We honor you. We magnify you. We just thank you for your presence always available to us, a very present help in a time of need. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lord. I love the Lord. Do you love the Lord? I love him so much. And I learn to love him more and more every day. I hope that's the same for you. Because he loves you deeply and greatly. He loves everyone in the world. One thing I was thinking about as I was preparing for this message, uh, the communion this morning. Uh, I need an element, some elements up here for me. It's this. Um, is that... Thank you, Dad. <laughs> Hallelujah. Is that the Father God, mm, I just said Father, and that the Holy Spirit just said, just stirred something in me. Father God, he's the best father that any person can ever have. Hallelujah. And he loves, he loves his children so much. John 3, 16. I know it's a very popular verse, but let's look at it. Just turn there real quickly. If you have your Bibles, you should never come to church without your Bible. And don't rely on the technology because it's not always available. Be ready with your sword. When you read the word of God, it begins to do something in you. Faith is stirred up. Hallelujah. The word is alive. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The word so stood out to me when I read it. For God so loved the world. He loved the world so much. He loves the world so much. He loved the world. It's in past tense here only because of what he's, what the writer is talking about, what God did because of his love, out of his love. But that doesn't mean God, God's love has passed. It means that it's still available. It's still here. It's still present. It's constantly talking. His love is constantly communicating to you and to me and to every person in the world. God saved the whole world through his son, Jesus Christ. He loved the world so much. He had to do something about it. He sent the Lord Jesus. God was not willing and is still not willing that any should perish. He said he loves the world so much that he has sent his be only begotten son so that anyone, whoever, whosoever, whoever may believe, who would believe, anyone it doesn't matter who you are what you're doing or what you have done those who are watching on live it doesn't matter what you have done and what you find yourself in his love is working he hasn't stopped loving any one of us and his love is so powerful you know love provides absolutely what you need. When you say you love someone, you provide something. You provide what they need. You are attentive to the need. And you, you set up an atmosphere. You set something up to where the need is met. And the love of the Father is no different. In fact, he's the one who shows us how to love. He did something with Jesus Christ. He loved the world so much. This is the verse of scripture in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 6 through 7. I'll read it very quickly. But, but one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? 
the writer here is wondering, and as he's, he's quoting uh, what Paul, David said in Psalms. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than Elohim. In the King James it says, than the angels, but it's the word Elohim. It's the same word used for God. A little lower than Elohim. Thou crownest him with glory and honor. See, here he's expressing what God has done. He's showing us how special each and every human being is. I said God saved the whole world. The whole world has been saved. He crowned him with glory and honor and did set him over the works of his hands. We saw that in Genesis, right? Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. I'm going to stop right there. Why does God think so highly of every human being? Why does he love the world so much? There's some treasure that he put in every person, in every individual. There's something of himself that he has instilled in every person. And even though the, the man, Adam, has failed and fell from grace, plummeting every human being into the life of sin, God did not just let it stay that way. He loved us so much that he had to do something about it. Hallelujah. He sent his only beloved son, his only begotten son, to pay the price of sin. Now, we talked about this last time I was here, talking about it. The, the penalty of sin is death. And someone had to pay it, but we didn't have enough to pay for the sin. We could have attempted, each one of us, but we would not come back. We were completely bankrupt in the sense that we could not pay the debt and come out of that debt. But there's only one person that could do that. And that was the man, Christ Jesus, who was able to pay the price and come back from the payment. Hallelujah. Jesus did all he can to ensure every man's salvation. He dealt with the, with the life of sin or the issue of sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 and he made him, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see love? You see the love there? He provided a way that we could not provide for ourselves. He reconciled the whole world through Jesus' Jesus' death. Watch this. Now, reconciliation, just real quickly, is to restore and to bring back to friendship, to bring back to a place of peace and harmony, you right? In Colossians chapter 1, verse 19, it says, uh, For it pleased the Father, it pleased the Father, hallelujah, God so loved the world. It pleased Him. That in him, in Jesus, all the fullness shall dwell. And by him to reconcile all things. Say all things. It's funny it says things here. He reconciled all things to himself. Say to himself. God the Father, through Jesus Christ, reconciled all things to himself. Brought peace to all things to himself. He brought everything in alignment with his peace for himself. Having made peace through the blood of his cross, it says. I want to continue. It says, by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made all peace through the blood, or made peace through the blood of his cross. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the whole world to himself. Say to himself. Not in putting their trespasses to them. The world needs to hear this message. He's not in putting 
the trespasses of the world unto them. It was inputted onto Christ. He became sin for every man, woman, boy, girl, so that no one has to pay the price. He paid it already. So that all you have to do now is step into what he paid for. You can walk free. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. For the love of Christ compels us, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, because we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. So you reckon yourself have died. Man, remember, man is a free moral agent. God has made it to be this way. And as a free moral agent, now you have to make a choice. Once you have found out that someone has paid a price for you, are you going to walk under the condemnation of something that has been paid for? Or are you going to walk in its freedom? You make your choice. And the choice is, are you going to accept the Lordship of Jesus Christ and the life that he came to give? Or are you going to try to live this out yourself? And that's the real, that's the bottom line choice that we all had to make. And many of us in this room and those that are watching may have already made that choice. But there are some people that may not have made that choice yet. And today is the day that you can make that choice. That's what communion is about. God wants us to commune with him in this new life of freedom, this new life of success, this new life, this divine life that he has given us to live with him, to walk with him, to be as even he is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to read one more thing here. When we look at the scripture about the communion, and I just mentioned it already, but I'm going to read it together. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, starting there, says, For I have received, now this is um, uh, the disciple or Paul saying, I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. I know it's a simple message. It's something that, that we talk about all the time here. But I really feel in my spirit that there are those today that need to hear this, this again. To understand that Jesus Christ, out of the love of the Father, who loved the world so much, he so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, again, no matter who you are, no matter how bad you think you are, no matter how bad someone has told you you are, no matter all the negative things that you have done, it doesn't matter how low you have gotten. The bottom line is you are that whosoever. And that if you believe in the Lord Jesus and make him Lord of your life, you too can walk in newness of life. He would take you, he would change you, he would clean you up, and he'll make you a brand new person. So if you would, if you, everyone can for a moment, stand with me as we get ready to take these elements. But I want to give an opportunity to those who are watching and those who are here. If you have not received Jesus as Lord of your life, I want to give you the opportunity to give your life to Christ. And just repeat after me. If, just say, dear Lord God, I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. I believe that he died for me, for my sins, and to save my soul. I believe that God raised him from the dead, and he's alive today. 
and forever. Lord, I confess with my mouth that you are now Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. By faith, I receive eternal life into my spirit. I am saved now. I receive your Lordship. I am a child of God. I am born again. From this day forward, I'm yours. Amen. Praise God. Those that are watching, thank you. If you have received the Lord Jesus, if you repeated this prayer with me with all of your heart, you are saved today. You have, re you have stepped into salvation. And I want to encourage you to reach out to someone, let somebody know that Christ has come into your life, that you have given your life to Him. And also, you can reach out to us. We would love to talk with you. We would love to pray with you. And right now, we're going to take part of the elements today in, rem in reminder... It's a reminder that Jesus has died for us. We have new life in him. We are even healed because of the new life. We are made strong because of the new life. We are made healthy because of the new life. Hallelujah. God is always with us because of the new life. If you would, lift the bread in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for what you've done on the cross. Father, thank you for sending your son. We don't take it lightly. We receive this bread, hallelujah, in remembrance of his sacrifice. Take and eat all of it. And we're going to take the cup now. Praise you, Lord Jesus. It's by the shedding of his blood that the sins have been remitted. And as we have accepted him as Lord, the blood is wa has washed us clean from all unrighteousness. And as we take, as I said last time, as we continue to walk in the word of God, it continues to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We're being cleansed daily by the blood of Jesus through the word. Thank you, Father, for your blood. Thank you for sending your son and having him shed the blood that was required for the sin. We don't take that lightly. We thank you so much that we now live a sin-free life as we continue in you. As your word continues to work in us, we continue to walk more and more perfect every day by your word in Jesus' name. Thank you. Receive the, the wine. Praise the Lord. Darkness comes in the deepest sense is when the light of God shines the brightest. I'm reminded of Egypt and Goshen in Egypt. Extremely dark, but among God's people, the light was shining. Why? Because God is our light. And if God's in our midst, the light is always shining. And the Bible says that his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Gives us wisdom for the future. Gives us understanding for every day that we walk. May God bless this time together and bless his word. We're going to go back to a passage, we'll go back to a scripture, or at least the subject that we've been, I started last week. Dreams and visions. Dreams and visions. Now, I am absolutely convinced. Now, folks, you're going to have to listen with your spiritual ears this morning because I'm absolutely convinced that we as the church, the church at large, is living in the Joseph season. Now, I, now I did try to explain and express what I believe God gave me for this year. What does it mean to be in a Joseph season? To know what that means, you have to study the life of Joseph so you can understand that, you know, because when you think of seasons, you don't. We arrive at seasons, we go through trials and tests, but we arrive at a season. Are you with me? 
So the trials and the tests that we go through prepares us for the season that we enter. There used to be a saying years ago, still is relevant and appropriate for today. Every level is new devils. New devils in every level, which means you have to qualify in the level that you're in to be able to go to the next level. Qualify. Everybody say qualify. qualify. Say it again. Say qualify. qualify. Everybody needs to qualify. Well, you know, you've been to school, haven't you? You have to qualify in one grade to get to the next. If you don't qualify, you don't go. If you don't pass the test, you don't go to the next level. Come on, church. I said, if you don't pass the test, you don't get to the next level. And after you've completed several levels, then you arrive at another season. You go through middle school and high school, finally you get to the new season, college. Now, I didn't plan on saying all that, but just all of a sudden it came out of my spirit this morning. But I want you to hear, this, we're talking about dreams and visions here. And we're living in a time of Joseph's season. Now, now, whether you're convinced of this or not, I am absolutely convinced. Because I believe this is what God shows me for the church. I'm not just talking about Oasis. I'm talking about the church at large, God's church. And God's church is all over the world. One body, amen? And I'm talking about the church, the, the, the part of the church that's the remnant. The remnant are the ones whom God, not only God has chosen, but those who walk with God. The remnant. Those are the ones who is walking with God faithfully. We also discovered that the keys to Joseph's life was faithfulness. Joseph is a prime example of being faithful. And God always reward faithfulness. Amen. We look at the parables where Jesus said, because you've been faithful in little things, I'll give you authority over many. Right? So several parables we find faithfulness requires, no, it, 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 God requires faithfulness for you to be promoted. And in faithfulness, you have the, the qualities and the abilities to pass the test. Amen. So we're looking at Joseph's lives, Joseph's life, and we see Joseph has gone through. In fact, Joseph had endured betrayal. He endured slavery. Is that right? He endured imprisonment and he endured rape charges. And then he got to his season. I said, then he got into his season. Amen. So open your Bibles with me. Let's go to, to Acts and chapter 7. Acts and the 7 chapters. We, we went to this passage before. May God help us to hear this morning what he has to say. Acts chapter 7. Again, we're talking about dreams and visions. As to the Joseph seasons that we're in, the season that we're in. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Now, I did give you a definition of what dreams, dreams, the definition of dreams, one of which, thoughts, images that passes through your mind while you're asleep. That's one area of dream. The other would be to consider something you can imagine as possible. Can I say that again? Another understanding of dream is to consider something you can imagine as possible. 
Much of the things we enjoy, all the inventions that we enjoy in this life, is because somebody had a dream. Somebody had a dream that we can get to, from one point to the next a lot faster than just driving a car. Come on, church. Somebody had a dream that you don't have to, ha you don't have, to have a phone on your wall with a cord attached to it. That we can talk to each other on a cordless element around the world. And you can even speak face to face as you're talking to someone in your presence. S that came out of a dream. Something somebody consider as possible because of their imagination. There's nothing wrong with imagination because imagination is something that God gave us. I said God gave us imaginations. This is, how, this is why we're able to invent things that makes our life a whole lot more pleasurable and easy. Some of you are dreaming. Don't let anybody talk you out of your dream because it, it, it might be something that God gave you. And you shouldn't deny it. We discovered that dreams are from God. It's one of the primary ways that God speaks to his people, particularly in the Old Testament. I said one of the primary ways God speaks to his people. We find through the patriarchs, the, those of the prophets of old, often God will give them dreams. And God speaks through dreams. In most cases, dreams have to be interpreted to be understood because it's always a, an, an allegory, something that is, that is not exactly what you, what you need or what you can understand at the moment, but it has to be interpreted. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Now, Joseph, had, God gave Joseph a dream, and Joseph's dream didn't need to be interpreted because it, two dreams back to back needed no interpretation. He understood what it meant. His father understood what it meant. His mother understood what it meant. And his brethren understood what it meant. It was absolutely clear. Didn't need to be interpreted. In fact, it was so clear that his brothers envied him. When he spoke of the first dream, they didn't like him. They said the Bible says that they hated him. And then he had another dream that comes on the heels of that first dream, similar to the first dream. And then he told his brothers again. And the Bible says they hated him even the more because of his dream. Because they understood what that dream meant. God made it clear that he gave him something that he intended to bring to pass. And not all dreams are from God. That's why it's necessary to pray before you go to bed. It's necessary you don't eat too much before you go to bed. You just might have some dreams. <laughs> you just might have some dreams that you don't like very much. And all your dreams, it doesn't necessarily mean it's from God. And how we find out that dreams are from God is when, God, when, when, it, when it's brought back to you at a later time, even during that day, or two days later, all of a sudden the reality of that dream comes back to you as clear as day. That means it certainly means in most cases God is saying something to you. And so what, you need, what we need to do is ask God, what does this mean? Show me, Lord. Give me understanding, revelation, of what this dream meant. Or what does it mean to me? Is everybody still here? We also discovered that when you have a dream that's back to back in the same context, it means that it, it is already established in God's mind and it's about to come to pass pretty soon. These are principles that you find in Scripture, the dreams that when God gave you something, He intends to bring it to pass. Hello? 
But God's purposes are often delayed, but never denied. So dreams are usually not for the moment. It usually, when God gives you a dream, is for the future. Are you listening? And you should not put a timetable on it. You should expect it to happen, but you shouldn't put a timetable on it because our time is not God's time. God says a day is as a thousand years. A thousand years is as a day. We find in, in Psalms, I believe the 90th Psalm and the fourth verse, that's as a day before God, well, it did, it did make reference to a thousand years, but it, it, it happens like this. You can go for, he said, a thousand years is as but last night to God, as a day to God, yeah. and vice versa. Yeah. So never put a time limit on when your dreams will become a reality. Hello? You just trust God all the way through the times, the good times, the bad times. Because if God gives you a dream, he intends to bring it to pass if your dream is from God. Are you still with me? Why you, you look like you're falling asleep here this morning? I'm trying to help you because every time you have a dream, don't ever relegate it to God all the time. Just know when God gives it to you, you will know when it is if you will seek understanding. Get wisdom, and with all that getting, get understanding. You still here? Amen. So then Joseph, since we're in the season of Joseph, Joseph had this dream that God gave him, two dreams God gave him. The dream started at the age of 17. He received it 17 years of age. Still here? The dream that God gave, the dreams that God gave him was not manifested until 13 years later. He started at 17 and the dream was manifested at 30. That's 13 years later. 13 years later. Between the time that God gave it to him and the reality of it, he had to endure betrayal. He had to endure slavery. Come on now. He had to endure <laughs> imprisonment. And he had to endure rape charges. Hello. I said, <laughs> well, ho hold your place in Acts and just let's go immediately over to Psalms 105. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Psalms 105. Are you still doing okay? Let's ask God for his anointing over this so that we can be prepared for what's about to happen to the church in 2024. Hallelujah. Come on. Let's get, let's get, let's get happy about this thing. Hallelujah. Woo, glory be to God. Let's get prepared for what God has for us. And I declare, I decree to you this, this more than any other time in my life, I am more confident today than I ever was in ministry in the last 38 years of ministry that we're about to see the hand of God this year. It started last year. The year of what? Divine recovery. Recovery begins. Recovery takes time. See, many of you have been dis disappointed already because we, we said divine recovery and you thought it was supposed to happen right then, 2023. But if you're recovering from an illness, it doesn't happen at that moment. It's progressive. It starts at that moment, and it's progressive. So whatever God started last year, oh, hallelujah. Whatever he started last year, we will see much of it this year, and it will continue to be till we will see the ultimate fulfillment of his promises. You mark my words. I speak from the voice of God this morning because I know, but I, I know that I know that I know. It's not in my head, it's in my Noah. Right. My Noah is in my heart. Amen. Amen. Huh? Amen. 
two th- you better get ready for it. Now, now, this is for the remnant. I have to emphasize this because you have every believer just went, oh my, God's going to bless me with a million dollars. God's going to give me this Mercedes. God's going to give me all. And you haven't been faithful. Don't look so sad. God rewards faithfulness. Some of us are looking for favor, but we haven't been faithful. Because favor is, oh, you remember what I said. You remember. Favor is fair. It's fair. Don't look so sad. Come on, get glad. Put a smile on your face. Because if, if you've been faithful to God, you watch what happens to you this year. It's only going to be from the hand of God. Some of you are a little bit dis- disappointed with what happened to you last year. But I tell you what, we have so many testimonies. I've got testimonies of what God started. And I see it, God unfolding these things in this year. It's already started. started last year. We're about to enter into a promise that God gave us years ago. Are you listening to me this morning? I said we're about to enter into a promise that God gave us several years ago. And no one can say we've done it. We can never say we've done it. We have to say, look at what God has done. We have to say it is the hand of mercy, the grace of God that did this. Hallelujah. It's called the blessings of the Lord. Now here's, here's uh, Psalms 105. Look at Psalms 105 and verse 16, starting at verse 16. It says, moreover, he called for a famine in the land. Now stop there, look up here. Just for you, for you folks who, who don't, who, who's not uh, understanding what that verse means to begin with. God called for a famine in the land in Joseph's day. While he was in Egypt and his family is still back in their land right he's at this point he's in Egypt at this point he's in the, he's in he's he's in prison well he's out of prison and now he's standing now we've read all this in in uh, Genesis 37 now you have to get last week's teaching so you can catch up so he's he went through the process of, of being betrayed, the process of slavery, the process of, of imprisonment. Now he's in, he's in the palace. And it says that God himself, verse 16, moreover, he called for a famine in the land. That's God. This is how Joseph got to where he got to. Because he had answers for the famine. Everybody say answers. He said, moreover, he called for a famine in the land. And it says, he destroyed all the provision of bread. That's God. God's doing this. But look at the next verse. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet while he was in prison. With feathers, he was laid in irons. They said, history said, that's that's a, a... an iron around his neck, believe it or not. And verse 19 says, watch this, until the time that the word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. Oh, wow. Hello? I said hello. Verse 20, the king sent and released him, the ruler of the people, let him go free. Notice it says, until the time that the word came to pass. What word? The dream. God speaks through his dreams. Until it came to pass, that word of the Lord tested him. Tested him. Now, I like what the, the NLT puts it this way. It says, it's the, in the NLT, it says, the Lord tested Joseph's character. 
until the time that the word that God, the dream that God gave him came to pass. Oh, hallelujah. Put it up there. Somebody needs to see this. NLT 19. The NLT verse 19. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Can we find it? Is that it? Oh, <laughs> verse 19. Said, Until the time came to fulfill his dreams, the Lord tested Joseph's character. Your character will be tested when you receive a word from the Lord. Whether it's a word from Scripture or a prophetic word, you will be tested by it. I like what, the reason I asked for this uh, in the NLT, it says the Lord tested his character. Everybody say character. character. See, we thought for a long time character is developed through trials and tests. It's not true. Character is developed, it hasn't been developed, it's not developed through trials and testing. Trials and testing reveals character. It exposes your character. Because character is formed at the age of five. In the first five years of an individual lives, your character is, begin is formed. And as you grow, you strengthen in the character that you've been formed in. I didn't make that up. It's true. Go study it yourself. Are you listening to me? I, I couldn't believe it. At the age of five, in the first five years of your life, your character is formed. That's why it's, it's necessary to have good parents that can help form the character within the child. Whatever you learn in those first five years sticks with you for the rest of your life. Are you listening? In other words, you just build on it. You just build on it for the rest of your life. So he wasn't, God was testing his character. He didn't develop character in his trials and tests. In his trials and tests, his character was being revealed. That's why God was able to trust him in the season that he entered. Amen. Trials and testings bring you into your season. And that's where we are right now. We're entering into our season. Wow. Some faint amens, but that's okay. You'll see it with your eyes. And you'll be able to give God the glory for it. You'll see it with your eyes. You'll be able to give God the glory for it. You go through tests and trials and you enter into season. And Joseph's character was tested by God. And he held fast. He stayed faithful. This is why God entrusted him in the place that he gave him. Second in command of all Egypt. He is in charge of the entire nation of Egypt, the land of Egypt. Are you still here? He said, the Lord did what? Tested his character. Joseph had character. Now, I'm going to ask you, how about you? Your test reveals your character. Now, I want you to think for a moment. Uh, if you had the opportunity to take something that doesn't belong to you and you know for sure nobody will ever know, would you take it? Now you know 100%, there's no way anybody will ever find out, would you take it? This is a test of your character. How about getting through the, the, uh, uh, the grocery line, the cashier, gave you a whole lot more money after they, you paid for your 
you paid for your groceries and they end up giving you $20, $30 more because they miscalculated. They miscalculated how much they owe you after you paid for it. How, here's, here's, here's the problem. Here's the problem. You know, if you don't have character, you would think it's the blessings of the Lord. See, you would say, oh, look at what God, God has blessed me. God has blessed me. No, 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 no. Listen, it's a test of character. Did your mama and daddy taught you to be honest, to be fair, to be just? My daddy taught me years ago, whenever you make a decision, and if you found out later that you made a wrong decision, he says it this way, and he says it over the years. You made your bed, you lay in it, and make the best of it. It's something I'll never forget. I'll never forget all my life. When you make a decision that you realize is the wrong decision, he says, you, that's your bed. You made your bed, you lie in it, and you make the best of it. Hint, hint. It's character. I said it's character. If, you're gonna, if you have an opportunity to lie on your tax return and say you have two children that you take care of that you don't really take care of them, that you provided for for the entire year and you didn't do it. And there is no way they'll find out that you lied about it. And you end up getting $5,000, 2500 per child. And you would say, if you don't have character, you would say it's God's blessings. Because that's what test does, reveals your character, doesn't develop your character. So Joseph had character, and God knew it. He tested him for 13 years. Would you stay the course? Would you believe what I told you I will do for you? His dreams didn't need interpretation. He knew exactly what it meant. That not only his brothers, his mother and father will bow down to him, but the entire nation will bow to him at 17 years of age. And they thought it was pride. They said he, he, he his, even, even his father says, come on, come on. Jacob said to him, you, are you saying that me and your mother will bow down to you? The Bible says that Jacob rebuked him. The word rebuke was in there. You know why? Because they understood what that dream meant. Didn't need to be interpreted. But God was testing his character for 13 years. Isn't that interesting? And he stayed the course. Never, no, there's no record of him complaining. There's no record of him murmuring. There's no record of him blaming God. He didn't blame God for what he's gone through. He didn't blame God because he was in prison. He didn't blame God because of, of uh, him being put up on rape charges. He stayed the course. Even when it wasn't popular, even when he was in the darkest time of his life. Now, I'm saying all of this so that you can grab a hold of yourself and recognize that you too are going through things in life, but the things in life God is testing your character so he can bring to you what he's promised you, either through his word or through the prophetic voice that you've received. He'll test you the whole way. Stay the course. Look at your neighbor and say, stay the course. Tell somebody, follow God in this. God still speaks to his children through dreams, dreams and visions. He does. He still speaks. But it's not the primary way that he speaks to us in the New Testament 
under this new covenant. It's not the primary way. The primary way that God speaks to us as believers is in our spirit. A inner witness, because we've got the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, dwells in you. That's the Holy Spirit. H Hello? That same spirit you have in you, I have in me. And that's how God speaks to us, through that still, small voice, that quiet voice that we hear on the inside. Not here, but here. That's the primary way. And there are times he'll give us dreams. Usually when he gives dreams is because we haven't been listening in the New Testament. When you have a dream, God's trying to talk to you through a dream is because you haven't been listening. It means he's been quicking. He's been trying to talk to you. He's, God's been trying to talk to, to Saul for years until he was knocked off of his donkey on the road to Damascus. And God says, why are you kicking against the goad? King James says, the pricks. That means I have been pricking you and you keep denying what I've been trying to say to you. It's the pr number one way that God speaks to us today. Number one. Thank God for dreams now. Usually when you get a dream, it's because you haven't been listening. And God knows how to get through to you and I. He, he knows how to get to us by what he wants us to know. He'll give you a dream. He might send somebody to tell you something that only God knows, God and you know, to confirm to you that I've been trying to talk to you. Are you listening? Don't make stuff up. And try to get somebody to say something to you of what you want to hear. But when they say something to you that thus saith the Lord, it'll tell you what you've been pricked yeah. with that you haven't, given, you haven't given over or subjected or submit yourself to it. And somebody says, well, you know what? I've been told this so many times. This is like the fourth, fifth time that the prophet or the prophetess told me every time I turn around, somebody's telling me this, telling me that. And you think that's good. It's not good means you haven't been listening. Now, y'all, you, you, can I have a better amen? amen. See, if you've heard it for the fourth and fifth time over the years, it means it, you say, well, it's good because God is confirming. No, no, no. He confirms two, maximum three witnesses. After that is disobedience. You want me to quit now? You look, that look on your face. Is this too much for you? Am I going too fast? Am I speaking over your head? I'm telling you, if it's more than three times max, you've been disobedient. It's not a good thing. See, some boast, man, I've heard that so many times. Lord told me this several times. That's because you haven't done anything about it. Because that is not the primary way that he speaks to us. He speaks to us through our witness, through our spirits. That, that renewed, that new man. Everybody say new man. Amen. That's the primary way he speaks to us, through that new man. Hallelujah. So, he was tested until the time the word came to pass. He was tested his character was tested until it came to pass. If he had failed the test, he'd have to wait. Because God's purposes are often delayed, but never denied. When you have a delay, it's not because you... It's often it's because one reason is being disobedient. You've not been listening. Amen. And if there's a delay, it means there's something you, we're not doing to get to where God has called us. And I discovered, I discovered this. 
And it's interesting, all these years I discovered what it was that we weren't doing as a church, as we should have. Thank God we're on the road right now. We started doing it. But that, I discovered, and I'll tell, you that, I'll tell you what that is in a few. Still with me? So we go through trials and tests, but we arrive at seasons. So, go to Acts, go back to Acts and the second chapter, Acts chapter 2. Am I helping you this morning? All right, let's look at the second chapter of Acts chapter 2. Now, everybody knows and understand the day of Pentecost. You remember the story? Hello? The day of Pentecost. They were in the upper room. What most people don't realize is that when God, when Jesus spoke to them and said, tarry in Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father, wait for the promise of the Spirit, when Jesus spoke to them, there was 500 people. He spoke to 500. But when you read the story of Pentecost, only 120 went to the upper room. And he spoke it to 500, but only 120 went. It's enough to get any preacher discouraged. If you're speaking to a crowd of people, you want everybody to get it. You want people to receive it. I think it was uh, Dad Hagen that shared a story how he was... He was uh, disappointed, I read this several years ago, and I heard someone mention it recently, that he was so disappointed that all the preaching he's been doing at the church he was pastoring at the time, uh, all the preaching and teaching, God has given him some instructions, and it was powerful teaching, good sound doctrine teaching, and the people are not receiving it. And he felt like he was wasting his time all these years, because people are not receiving because we should have been further ahead. And so he went to God complaining about it. Listen, if you're going to complain, complain to God. Don't complain to people. If you have questions, you ask God about it. Okay? So uh, you say well, you shouldn't complain at all. Well, when you start complaining to the leader, God gets offended. Woo, boy, that didn't go over well. <laughs> Are you listening to me? If you complain, <laughs> if you complain to the leader, you offend God. Because God says, listen, they're not complaining to you, they're complaining to me. I'd rather them tell me that, not you. You say you got script? Yeah, I got scripture for that. But that's not where I'm going right now. See, I. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Come on, say, thank you, Lord. All right, the day of Pentecost, <laughs> the day of Pentecost, here it is. Uh, the people that was in Jerusalem at the time, you remember the story, the Holy Spirit fell, 120 in the upper room. I was telling you the story about... Uh, Dad Hagen, he was, he was saying that he was dis, discouraged and disappointed, and the Lord spoke up to him and says, you shouldn't be. He said, because the Lord Jesus said, that even happened with me. He said, only one-fourth of the people will do what you tell them, and one-third of them will get the, tw the 30, 60, and 100-fold return. You remember, the, you remember the parable of, this, of the sower? Out of four, only one did something with it? Come on, church, you still here? The parable? The par one fourth. So uh, let's try to figure this out. 500 was instructed, 120 ended up there. That's about one fourth. That's really actually 120. I think 125. It's one fourth of 500. So they ended up in the upper room. 
The Holy Ghost fell upon them, and the Bible says came upon them as cloven tongues of fire, and they all began to prophesy. Everybody in the, in the city at that time in Jerusalem heard them. There was, I think it was like nine different languages. They're hearing those people speak in tongues, speaking their own language. This is a miracle of tongues, not a miracle of hearing. Some people try to teach and tell us that, no, it was a miracle of hearing. Because they said, how, could, how come we hear them speak in our own language? No, it was tongue. It was speaking, not hearing. Still with me? So when they heard this, they said, they, said they marveled and said, what is this? And some say, well, these people have been drunk on wine. And Peter stood up and he preached, the Bible says, and he said, no, 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 no. This is not what you suppose, seeing that it's 9 o'clock in the morning. But he says, this is that that was spoken of the prophet Joel. Joel prophesied in Joel 2, chapter 2. I try to tell Joel that. <laughs> but he ain't listening. All right, now, <laughs> wait a minute, watch this. Joel, 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 Joel chapter 2, <laughs> Peter, Peter is preaching, right? Let's get the right verse. All right, now wait a minute, wait a minute, hold on, wait for me, wait for me. Chapter 2, hallelujah. So, w w let's get to the right verse. We're, uh, come on, just hold on, hold on. <sighs> hallelujah. All right, I'm in verse 12. Peter stood up in verse 14. And verse 16, it says, in verse 16, it says, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. He says, what did he speak? It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Everybody say all flesh. He says, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on your men servants and on your maid servants, I will pour out my spirit on those, in those days, and they shall prophesy. He says, your sons and your daughters will prophesy. He said, even your men servant and your maid servants will prophesy. When? In the last days. So Peter is saying, this is it. That both male and female, sons and daughters, will be prophesying. Now the word prophesy doesn't mean, it doesn't mean what most of the church think that means. It means, prophesying means to speak forth. Not foretell, F-O-R-E, not foretell, but forthtell. To prophesy means to foretell. Anybody say foretell. Forth say it again. It means, to, it means to foretell by divine inspiration. That means the Holy Spirit moves you to speak. That's the pure gift of prophecy. It's not necessarily telling the future. We always think prophesying is to tell the future. No. The pure gift of prophecy is to foretell by divine inspiration. While you're foretelling, you might get information about the future. But information about the future is not prophecy. Prophecy is saying the mind and purpose of God by divine inspiration. And then down, God might download to you what's going on in the future. Okay. Did you get that? All right, so don't think because you say this person prophesied to you, you got to tell you everything about the future. No. Uh, it can be, but the true gift of prophecy is speaking forth by divine inspiration. Ah, uh, boy. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and all that. Are you still here? So he says, both sons and daughters will prophesy. We'll be speaking. We'll be speaking by divine inspiration. 
Why is all this necessary? Because in the New Testament, under this new covenant, God will use everybody. You don't have to be mature for God to use you. You just have to be available. Come on, church. God has always done it that way. He spoke to Joseph at 17. Every one of the apostles was under 30. He chose these young men, under 30, young. And so the prophecy then, your young men will see visions. New Testament. Your old men will dream dreams. Old Testament. Here's that young man, he's dreaming dreams because that's, that's, that's the way God primarily speaks. If you're available, he'll use you. I don't care if you're male or female. Okay, if man, woman, boy and girl, God will use you if you're available. He said in the last days. How many know that's where we are today? We are in the last days, especially now in the last of the last days that we're in. God speaking through his servants, the available ones. That's the remnant. I just ran out of time. But I want to finish this. I want you to get this because, you know, I ended with, 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 uh, with the fact that Joseph, and I'll end again, so I, I, I thought I was going to end today, but is this okay? I mean, is everybody learning? Are you learning? Is it helping you? All right, now watch. See, I ended with Joseph, how the fact that Joseph was the 11th son it was the 11th child. It was 12. Remember the 12 tribes came out of Jacob? Joseph was number 11. The one that came after him was Benjamin. Hello? The 11th child. And in the Bible, the 11 symbolize transition. The Joseph season. I said the Joseph season. Now, I didn't have all this when God gave me this year, what it means to the church. I didn't have this. This came as I began to seek after the Lord. See, the, jo it, the number 11 symbolized transition, and it's also associated with revelation, the kind of revelation that helps you into transition into something new and something overdue. Now you say, where did I get all that from? I looked it up. I looked it up and I found out transition is number 11 in Scripture. And then I went further and I found out it has to do with also with revelation, the kind of revelation that God gives you that helps you transition into something new and something that's overdue. Well, we're living now in, as oasis that we've been overdue. And we're about to enter into something new. Listen, church, and, and, and the people who have left will be so saddened to see. Will be so saddened to see because you know why? They didn't have endurance. Well, we don't get angry and upset. We, I, I'm, not, I'm not disappointed because the Bible tells us they left because they didn't belong with us. Because it said, no, it's, it's a scripture that says that. Because they didn't belong. If they had been, if they'd belonged, they would have stayed with us. And if they stayed with us, that was proof that they belonged with us. So don't get, I'm not disappointed. Are you listening? So we're now, we're now in that season where the heavens are open and God is transitioning us into something new that will blow the minds of all of our critics, our brothers and sisters, the 11 that was left behind, the brothers, you remember, it was his brothers that was envies. It was his brothers that hated him. 
for his dream. He did nothing to him. It was all God, but they envied him. They hated him even the more. So the lesson is don't tell your half-brothers your dream. Because they'll do whatever it takes to stop you from your fulfilling your dreams. Throw him in the pit, sold him into slavery. Your brother, your biggest challenge is going to be your brothers and sisters. It's not going to be the world. They don't care two strikes about what happens to you. They don't care. The world could care less. Your brothers and sisters will be your problem. Mm -hmm. That will be your biggest challenge, will be our biggest problem. But you know, we just follow God. And we can never boast about anything. We can boast on the faithfulness of God. And we can say, it must be the Lord. And God received all the glory, and he receives all the praise. And we continue to be faithful, follow what God's given us to do, and every one of you stay faithful in your place. As a result, you will see and experience the blessings of God. I'm telling you this by the Spirit of God, because he promotes faithfulness, and he favors those that are faithful. And the church, for now, say amen. amen. Stand up on your feet. Come on, let's stand up. Give the Lord a good praise. Let's thank God for his word. Just thank God for his word. Hallelujah.